panel here today, our first speaker will be Mary Phillips, a, a long time member of the party who has been involved in a number of campaigns for abortion rights. She will be followed by um, Sinead Kennedy from our sister organisation in Ireland who is spokesperson for um, a group called Action on X which is a group fighting for abortion rights in Ireland. She will be followed by Marianne Owens who is um, a member of the SWP in Cardiff. Um, on the executive board, part of, yes. the, um, part of the PCS, and also chair of a newly formed abortion rights group in Cardiff. All right, thank you. Yes, um, until I was 31, it was illegal to procure, have an abortion, or carry out an abortion in this country. And that was partly a result of a, um, a law passed in the 1861 called uh, the Offences Against the Person Act which made it um, uh, such a dreadful offence to have anything to do with procuring an abortion that the actual maximum sentence for that was life imprisonment. But as far as I can make out, that was never carried out. The most that was ever um, passed, the longest sentence was six years. And on the whole, they didn't tend to do that. But it was so... Um, frightening for lots of people that when I was a young woman um, in the 1960s I often used to get uh, teenage girls ringing me up giving me a false name over the phone and saying they wanted to come and stay with our family for a few days because of something they didn't specify but of course it was always that they had had an illegal abortion they couldn't go back home to their family and tell their mother that they'd had an abortion because that would be the pits and so the, quite a few people we had staying with us in the 1960s um, during those years when it was illegal uh, it's impossible to get actual um, figures for the number of illegal abortions that were carried out in this country because people didn't want to come back forward and, and say that they had injuries that were caused by abortions in case they or the abortionists ran the risk of being arrested. And uh, if anyone's seen the film Vera Drake, they will see what that was all about. Um, I interviewed an old lady in the 1970s who had had an illegal abortion as a young woman and had ended up having to sit over a bucket. I mean, it was absolutely horrendous what she described, but she still, even after all those years, she didn't want me to put her name anywhere. She was still frightened, you know. Um, then it was estimated in 1950 that as many as 20% of gynecological admissions to the NHS were due to botched abortions. And many resulted in infertility, septicemia, and death. Before 1967, 500 to 600 <coughs> deaths were reported as women died from um, complications in Britain. They, um, if anyone here thinks that the 1967 Abortion Act led to free abortion on demand, they need their brains testing. But it did mean that abortion was no longer always illegal and uh, you had to have t two doctors signing to say that you needed an abortion and lots of doctors just did it you know but thank goodness and uh and ever since then we've had uh various different groups and quite often um, members of parliament trying to limit the women's right to abortion and we've had to uh, fight hard against all these things um we set up, in the 1970s, we set up the National Abortion Campaign and we had a uh, march. We gradually managed to get the trade unions involved and when um, this bloke, Corrie, tried to... Um, he really wanted to get rid of the right to abortion, I think, but 80,000 people marched against his attempts and, and there's always been large... Um, uh, demonstrations and um, um, it's quite clear to a lot of people that the, the people that try to limit 
abortion rights or say that they're doing it for women's own good benefit because you know it's it's bad for you to have an abortion and you need help to uh, to not have it or get, have counselling or get round it or in some way um, that really they want to altogether get rid of women's right to control their own fertility whether to have children or not have children they don't want women to be able to decide that and uh, also I mean there was a bloke called Alton who tried to make out that women women deliberately got pregnant in order to have abortions unbelievable and uh, um, half of the abortions worldwide now are unsafe and that is about 21.6 million a year including 18.5 million in developing countries and 47,000 um, women die each year from complications. Close to 13% of all maternal deaths in the world are due to unsafe abortions, which are more in regions, of course, where abortion is illegal, which is fairly obvious. It is important, I think, for us to, to realise that after the Russian Revolution in 1917, um, women's right to abortion they could could have free abortion on demand and it wasn't until Stalin uh, the advent of Stalinism and um, all the sort of uh, you could get a medal for having lots of babies and to be a heroine of the Russian revolution and all that stuff until then the women really had the right to, to decide on their own families and what we want now I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just say um, the slogan that we used to say in the um, national abortion campaign, not the church and not the state, women must decide their fate. <laughs> and, um, what we want worldwide is free abortion on demand everywhere. Um, it's just interesting that that slogan, not the church, not the state, women must decide their fate. That is um, the past week in Dublin, that, uh, and right around the country in fact, that is, uh, uh, that is a slogan um, that young men and women right across the country um, have been shouting in their campaign uh, for abortion rights um, in Ireland. If you've been following the debate at all, because I, I think it has been kind of covered quite w- um, widely, um, on Friday evening in the small hours of the morning, um, abortion was legalised in Ireland in the most um, unimaginab- unimaginably restrictive terms. It is, um, it's difficult to imagine how you could have even come up with the restrictions that they have, um, that they have come up with, but, but believe me, they have. Um, and uh, what I just want to do is maybe use my time is just to talk a little bit about how we got um, to, this, uh, to this situation. What it essentially means now is that if your life is at risk, um, you are legally entitled to an abortion, and there is now legislation to give that uh, um, effect. So certainly from the right-wing point of view, I think it is an, a massive defeat, and the church and the right-wing have been mobilizing enormously, huge amounts of money, they've had you know, um, significant tens of thousands of people out on the streets trying to push, put pressure on the government not to legislate. Um, that doesn't mean, I think, that, um, you know, that despite all the talk, they've been saying things like the floodgates are opening, we're going to have abortion on demand. Uh, like I said, you can have an abortion quite literally if your life is at risk. And even then, there are so many um, signatures and boxes to tick that in many ways it's very difficult to see how it's actually going to save the lives um, of, uh, of, any, uh, of any women. <laughs> But I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so how do we get to this, uh, um, to this um, situation in Ireland? And uh, as I don't have very much time, I'm just going to go through it very, very quickly. But I think the starting point has to be the 1983 uh, pro-life amendment, which um, Mary was just telling me that she was involved um, in 1983. You were there, yeah. there campaigning, <laughs> campaigning against it. And what the 1983 um, so-called pro-life amendment was uh, a move by uh, the Catholic right in Ireland who exerted enormous pressure on two um, uh, governments to insert the following amendment into the Constitution. Now, abortion was le- illegal in Ireland anyway, okay, under the 1861 um, Offences Against the Person Act. But I suppose on the back of the women, women's movement internationally, 
uh, and the fact that abortion was being legalized in Britain and in the United States and other European countries. Um, the, you know, the anti-choice, what they call themselves uh, the pro-life campaign, um, managed to sort of convince two uh, quite conservative governments that abortion was just a stone's throw away from Ireland and we needed this, uh, Ireland needed this uh, uh, amendment to sort of add a certain kind of sense of, of belt and braces to make sure that abortion continued to be illegal. And they put the following amendment in. The state acknowledges the right to life of the unborn and with due regard to the equal right to life of the mother, guarantees in its laws to respect and as far as practical by its laws to defend and vindicate that right. What essentially that means is that in the Irish constitution, the life of a fetus, which is essentially defined from now, from implantation onwards, conception implantation, um, is, e is equal to, and in some ways actually regarded as superior to that, what they call a mother, but a pregnant woman. Um, that, is, that, is, that is the law in Ireland. So if you're pregnant, your life is as valuable um, to the Irish state as that of a, 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 collection, of, a, collection, of, a collection of cells. And that influences all abortion law in Ireland. And just to give you a small example of, I think, the context in which um, our, what Ireland was like in the 1980s, so that that, um, that, that um, amendment could be inserted into the Constitution. Um, I just want to give you the example of Anne Lovett. Anne Lovett, this is the following year in 1984. Anne Lovett, was, she was 14 when she became pregnant. She was 15. And when she was 15 years of age in November 1984, she gave birth to a baby. Uh, she, she had told everybody that she had concealed her pregnancy and never told anybody, any of her family or friends, that she was pregnant. And when, um, um, when she went into labour, she left her house in the middle of the night. She lived in a tiny little town in the Midlands of Ireland, a very small, kind of quite conservative little town called Granart. And she went into a grotto. I don't know if people know what a grotto is. They're all over Ireland. They're kind of little, kind of, um, little altars in fields and kind of um, small towns to the Virgin Mary. And there was a grotto in the middle of a field. And she went into that grotto in the middle of winter and she gave birth by herself alone to her baby. And she died and her baby died alone in that grotto. And that was, that was what Ireland was like in the, 19, uh, in the 1980s. And that was the kind of climate um, in which allowed um, the, um, something like that uh, pro-life amendment to be inserted into the constitution with two thirds of the, uh, of the electorate um, voting for it. But, move on um, until 1992 and then there was the very famous, um, I don't know if people know, called the X case. Mm -hmm. And the X case is very, very important for lots of reasons because I think uh, in ways that I don't have time to go into, it was very much a kind of turning point in many ways for Irish society, but it was particularly a turning point when it came to abortion. What the X case was, was a 14-year-old child who had been raped by a family friend. Her parents took her to England for an abortion. And it was in the early days of kind of DNA testing. And they contacted their local guard station and wanted to know if tests could be done after the abortion to use in the prosecution of her rapist. And the, guard, the, uh, the guards, police in Ireland, uh, called the Attorney General and asked his advice on it. And his response was to slap an injunction on her, uh, telling her parents to take her back, into, uh, back to Ireland and to, um, that she wasn't allowed to have an abortion. So out of fear of prosecution, they took her back, um, they appealed this to the High Court, and the High Court upheld the, uh, upheld the injunction. So she was present, uh, prevented from leaving the country for a period of 11 months, so that she couldn't leave the country to have an abortion. And it was summed up very well by a cartoon um, on the front of the Irish Times, in which you had our, uh, a map of Ireland, and around the 26 counties was a fence of barbed wire and inside was a, was a child holding a rag doll and um, this was back in the times of the troubles and that and the headline was internment in Ireland for, 40, uh, for a 14 year old um, rape victims and again it was this huge story that went, uh, went right around the world but what happened next was very very significant and I think this is also uh, I want to argue politically very significant because once the story broke in the Irish Times um, there was just an overwhelming response of people. Thousands of people took to the streets and demanded that this child not only be allowed to travel to Britain, but that she had the right to have an abortion in Ireland. And there was thousands of people on the streets, and some of the people here in the room were involved in organizing, um, uh, organizing that protest. 
and also um, what ha I mean, it was also it was um, there was a march which was about of ten thousand, which today maybe in, in the grand scheme of kind of global protest seems very very small. But in Ireland, in 1992, ten thousand people on the streets mm -hmm. saying that a woman, a, a child, mm -hmm. had the right to have an abortion was enormous, and it was terrifying to the political establishment. And there was talk of um, of strikes. The post office workers were te threatening to go out on strike, and the government were terrified. And they offered to pay the, the legal fees for the parents to appeal it to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, in under pressure, I think, from the thousands of people who were on the streets, came up with a slightly what most people would kind of consider a slightly esoteric reading of that amendment that I just uh, read out. And they basically said was because she was so, she was so distressed by what had happened to her. Um, unsurprisingly, she wow. said that she would rather kill herself than go through with the pregnancy. And they, they said that was because she was suicidal, her life was at risk, and therefore she had the right to an abortion. Um, and, um, they, uh, and then there was two subsequent referendums, and the government on both occasions tried to take out suicide um, from, the, uh, from the Constitution, and they asked people to restrict suicide. And on two occasions, in 1992, just months afterwards, and again 10 years later in 2002, on both occasions, uh, people refused to do that. And ever since then, what we've seen is a growing support for abortion rights. Now, I don't have time to go through all the things that happened in between that, but then again, very quickly, there was another tragic case last year. Again, yeah. uh, unfortunately, this is how Ireland seems to make the headlines these days, so it's not a uh, banking crisis, it's uh, abortion. Um, it's, uh, this time, a woman died, a 33-year-old woman named Savita Halapanavar, who was an Indian woman who came um, with her husband to live in Ireland. And she was repeatedly refused a termination, even though she was experiencing an, an inevitable miscarriage, in that there was nothing they could do to stop the miscarriage. But because, theoretically, there was still a fetal heartbeat, the doctors repeatedly refused to give her an abortion. And she got septicemia and died. The irony of it was that Ireland loves to think of itself as this 21st uh, century, um, you know, sophisticated Western country. If Savita had actually been in India, the so-called third world Indian health service, she would have had an abortion and she would, have, uh, she would be alive today. And again, thousands of people, thank you, thousands of people took to the streets and demanded action on this. And again, the government were quite, uh, uh, were, were quite terrified. And even though there was a ruling from the European Court of Human Rights two years previously that said that they had to do something about the fact that there is a, a legal right to an abortion, that you have a constitutional right to an abortion if your life is at risk, but because there was no legislation, um, it, was, it, it was effectively null and void. So that's where we are today in that we have the legislation now. But as I said, it is so, it is so restrictive. So Mary talks about the 1861 um, um, Act that, was, um, that gives you life imprisonment um, with penal servitude if you have an illegal abortion. The Irish, the law that just went through the Parliament um, on, fr uh, on, fr uh, mm. I, uh, um, on Friday morning um, deletes that and instead puts in a 14-year criminal penalty. So if you have an illegal abortion in Ireland now, you're facing a 14-year criminal penalty. Now, Nobody, I mean, every the Taoiseach gets up or the Prime Minister gets up and says, no one's going to be prosecuted. Well, if no one's going to be prosecuted, what is a 14-year penalty do, yeah. doing there? And I, I, to be honest, do I think anyone's going to be prosecuted? No, I don't. But the point is exactly what Mary has uh, said. Women, you know, it's suspected that 15, uh, you know, 1,000 to 1,500 women use the abortion pill um, every month in Ireland. That is the ORU 486. Um, they take it, in, um, they import it illegally into the country. And there is that fear that if you're, for example, if you're experiencing um, heavy bleeding um, the, the, the following day, you're supposed to contact a doctor. But there is that kind of chilling effect that people are afraid. You don't know who, if you go to your doctor, you go to your GP, you don't know um, um, what, if, they're going to, if they're going to report you and what is going to happen. So it's that fear, and particularly for younger women, it is that kind of fear that, that is just not acceptable. If you're suicidal, and they, they basically have set up a number of panels so you have to convince an obstetrician, I don't know what an obstetrician um, is um, adjudicating on suicide for, but you to convince unanimously an obstetrician and two um, psychiatrists that you're, that you're suicidal. And if they don't agree to that, then you can appeal it to another uh, obstetrician and um, um, uh, two psychiatrists, and your GP is involved in it as well. So, you know, in practice, seven doctors 
will decide on whether you're suicidal and whether you're entitled to, uh, to an abortion. So yes, it's a defeat for the, um, it's a defeat for uh, the right in the sense that abortion is now legal in Ireland. But as, as I've explained, it's, it's very much a theoretical right. What woman is going to subject herself to an interrogation by seven doctors in order to get an abortion? Of course not. She'll, she'll take the abortion pill if she can't afford to travel to Britain, or she'll go to Britain, Spain, or the Netherlands, where most Irish women go to have abortions. The abortion rate in Ireland is exactly the same as the abortion rate in uh, Britain. Making abortion doesn't make, uh, making abortion illegal doesn't <coughs> stop women having abortions. It stops them having safe abortions. My final point is just about how do we win, because this is a debate that is going on very much in Ireland. And people like to think that it's all about lobbying your politicians. And, and Labour have been playing this game. Labour are now in, in power. Invi uh, you know, in, um, uh, elect us to power and we'll have abortion rights. Well, this is what the Labour Party, the Labour Party were the co-authors of this legislation. We have to look to the courts. We look to the Supreme Court. We look to the European Court of Human Rights. And that will give us our rights. But significantly, I think Ireland is a very important case in point. But the same thing, I think, if you look at what's happening in Chile at the moment, where an 11-year-old um, is pregnant um, um, after being raped by her stepfather, the church and the state are refusing to let her have an abortion. We've seen what's happened in Texas, where they're essentially closing 37 of the 42 abortion clinics. What, um, you probably saw the magnificent filibuster, but what got less uh, reported was the 15,000 people outside supporting Wendy Davis. But that is that is how we achieve abortion rights. It's when people got on the streets in 1992 and in 2012. That is what has forced the agenda. And it's not about lobbying politicians. It's not about appealing to the courts. It's actually getting people on the streets and fighting for our rights and winning people politically to the idea of a woman's right to choose. I'm humble if I'm sitting down and there's no microphone, so I'm just, I'm, yeah. I'm Marianne Owens, I'm from the, the SWP in, in, in Cardiff. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of things, but I'm going to talk about a campaign that we had recently in Cardiff. I can see some people from the Cardiff campaign in the room, so thank you all for coming. Um, okay, I mean, I wanted to start really, I mean, I was quite shocked when I, I started with a campaign in Cardiff that a lot of people in this country, it's been touched on already, a lot of people don't realise that abortion isn't actually completely legal in Britain. You still have to have the signatures of two doctors, you've got to convince two doctors that, 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 that as Mary said, half the time, you know, a lot of doctors will just sign it off. But there are occasions, if you've got a, a doctor that conscientiously injects, they're going to say no, and where do you go then? Well, they're closing down all the sexual health clinics, a number of Brooklyn advisory clinics and such like that have been closed down. They're the restrictive restrictions in that way. It, it isn't an automatic right, it is, you can't actually, it's not actually actually we, we, we know it's not the same in, in Northern Ireland as well. And I think, you know, at the moment we've got a, a, a real fight on our hands. Um, since the Tories got back into power, I mean this happens sort of circularly, every, every couple of years it, it comes up, but since the Tories <laughs> got back into power, we've seen a real increase in attacks on, on abortion rights. Um, we've seen <coughs> Nadine Dorries and a number of other MPs have staged repeated attacks attempting to, to, to change the time limits to make it make it make it less than 24 weeks. Um, and I, I like to call them anti-choice. I don't like calling them pro-life. If they were pro-life, then they'd look after our children who were disabled and who were sick and have proper education. They're not pro-life. But, 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 but you know, I mean, the, the other thing that we saw Nadine Durie says, and this was really quite sneaky, you know, in the private members' bill, they tried to get through uh, a motion that would mean that if you actually were going to have an abortion, you would have to have what they were calling independent counselling. Now, that wasn't independent counselling from, from, from health providers, that was independent counselling from charities that they'd named in, 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 the, actual, in the actual motion. And, and that tended to be people who were from anti-choice organisations and religious organisations. And I don't particularly want to have to go and be counselled by a priest if I actually want to go and decide what I want to do with, with, with my body. So that's, that's where we are. But also, very worryingly, uh, we're seeing a huge Americanisation of, of, of the attack. Um, we, we, we've had, we've had, you know, about 67. We, we, we've seen, you know, you know, they, 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 they call themselves that because of the 1967 Act, and, and 40 days for life. And, and you know, what happens in America quite quickly gets translated over here. And we've got to be really vigilant about this. And I'm going to talk about about why. You know, um, 40 days for life. They've been here in Bloomsbury. They've taken to standing outside abortion clinics or, or sexual health clinics in some cases, not even abortion clinics necessarily, and actually harassing women. This is a clear choice 
This isn't about you know having a reason to debate in Parliament or, or, or with the council. This is an attack on women. They're attacking vulnerable women and they're choosing to do that. I mean, they're standing there in Cardiff. They had a little doll that they were, they were thrusting into the hands of women that were trying to get into the clinic in Cardiff. And there's only one clinic in Wales, and that's that clinic in Cardiff. And we've, we've got, you know, these are very vulnerable people. We have a lot of asylum seekers in, 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 in Cardiff who, you know, God knows what's happened to them in, in whatever country they've been in before, and they're seeking an abortion for being raped or whatever in, in a war zone. You know, these, these are really quite vulnerable women. And it, even if it's not that, you know, there are many, many reasons. Nobody chooses ever to, to, to have an abortion. It's, it's not a, an easy choice to make. But the other thing that they do, you know, they've got these websites where they boast about how many women they've managed to turn away from an abortion clinic. You know, it's absolutely vile if you have a look at it. I mean, most, most of the ones I met, and they were mostly men, seemed to tell me that they got some, they were, they were all doctors. They all knew better than any of the medical providers that were inside the clinic. You know, and there many, there were doctors there, they got the time to be stood there for 40 days. I've got no idea. Um, but, you know, this is, this is where we are. But in Cardiff, we, we, we've, had a, we've had a really good campaign. We had... A bit of bit of bit of a of a, of a background of it anyway. Last year we had uh, Spook, the Society for the Protection of Unborn Children, uh, turned up in the middle of Cardiff, and we thought, oh, we're not having this. So a couple of us got together, you know, the the, the local feminist network, the SWP, and a couple of other people, a couple of some of the anarchists. So we got together and said, right, we ain't having this. We contacted the trade unions, we contacted all the women's groups, and we said, right, they're protesting for four hours, we're going to go and do it. So we, we charged them with the Trades Council banner, and the, the look on the faces of the six or seven people there with their, their signs <laughs> of a beating put us when we marched down the road with the Trades Council banner, you know, it, it was something, something else. But, you know, we, we do a bit of history of this. So when we found out that, that, that we had 40 days for life there, we, we, we did a similar thing. We, we put stuff out on, on social media, we contacted the trade unions, we contacted all of the women's groups, and we, we, we actually, we actually just, just went for it. We got there the, the first time, we, we actually spoke to the clinic as well, it was quite important we spoke to the clinic. They were there um, for, from 8am till 8pm outside harassing women outside the clinic. So we spoke to the people in the clinic, and they said, well, we'd rather you weren't here during opening hours, because it's frightening enough that there's a load of men waving pictures of the very Virgin Mary and throwing dolls of fetuses into people's hands over the road. So what we'd rather you do is do it when we're not open, you feel, because you're confronting them then and you're not actually confronting women, put, putting women off e e even further, which we, we completely agreed with. So we, we, did a number of, we did a number of things. The first time we got it, it was actually extremely long. We had to do this for six Saturdays in a row as well, by the way. We, we were going on on Saturday afternoon because they were giving out leaflets to them to the public in a busy shopping area. So we thought, you know, this is the time when we need to get our message across and actually talk to people about why they shouldn't be allowed to be here doing this and harassing people. Um, so, 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 so we got there. The first week we, we did a lot of chanting, not the church, not the state. There was an awful lot of that. But when you do that for a considerable length of time in the cold and the hail, it gets a bit tiresome, really. So we thought, well, what else can we do? So we got a number of people that were musicians. So the next week we had an amp. We had music playing, we had musicians that made up pro-choice pro, pro songs. We had an absolute ball. There, at one point there was about a hundred of us there dancing and singing Son of a Preacher Man, uh, the, uh, the 20 mostly men that were praying round a bin, and they were actually praying round a bin as well. <laughs> one of our favourite, one of our favourite chants that came. I mean, it was amazing, and there's a hundred women, and, and, and men actually as well. We had the argument about men, because some people said men shouldn't be coming to this, it's a, it's a women's thing. We had that argument through, you know, it's sex men as well, it's about that class. Class, it's not about, about, about gender here. So we, we, we actually won that argument as well. But you know, you, you've got a hundred people over here singing and dancing and banging tambourines, and you've got 20 people with crucifixes on sticks on their knees, round a bin, praying. They look absolutely ridiculous, to be perfectly honest. Um, so, you know, and this, this, was, this was good. Uh, the idea was for us to make them look a bit strange and a bit odd and completely marginalised, and I think actually it, it, it worked. Cheers, that's great. Um, I'm never going to fit all this in in 12 minutes, I'm sure. Um, so so, so that, was, that was what we were trying to do there. But there was other things that, that they did. I mean, I've never been aggressively prayed at before, and I have to say it's quite intimidating. <laughs> to have somebody standing right behind you praying for your womb is, is, is really not something Now, I'm, I think I'm fairly, fairly big in the um, trade unions and everything. That, that, that upset me, let alone some vulnerable women, woman trying to get into a clinic, you know. And this, this was this really nasty stuff they were coming out with. I know, but there were some things. We had, because it was over six weeks, at one point we had a bedroom tax demonstration in the morning. We managed to bring a load of people from the bedroom tax, the trade unions over to the, to, 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 to the, to the, to the counter vigil that we, we were having. You know, there was some really exciting stuff that, that was going on. We had loads of women and people just stopping, thanking us 
for being there and standing up to those people that were harassing the, the women that were trying to get in there. At one point, somebody from one of the local cafes came over and said, it's great what you're doing. Here's some vouchers, come and have some pizza when you finish. So we all went for pro-choice pizza when we finished actually, yeah. actually demonstrating. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, and one of the other things that, that, that we did was the women who worked in the clinic, the staff that worked in the clinic, were obviously having to walk past these people every day on the way to work. So we went out to the trade unions, we asked people to send in solidarity cards, you know, <coughs> we're supporting you and what you do, we're supporting the clinic and that's why the clinic's Because I think it's really important when Mary talks about 80,000 people being on the streets, that was involved in the trade unions and that's how we got the 1967 Abortion Act packed through. That, was, you know, that wasn't just women, so that was, that, that was everybody involved. Now, this went off weeks, it was, it was great fun, I made loads of new friends. And uh, we decided that we want to, you know, carry this on a little bit. So we've actually now set up uh, a group. We've got an abortion rights group in Cardiff. There's about 40 or so of us at the moment who are quite active. We've had a couple of jumble sales and done some fundraising. Um, we, we, we've been talking about, because in Wales, health is devolved, so we're looking at what we can do to put some pressure on the Welsh Government to, to maybe make some, some services better. But that's not the real reason why we want to keep that group there. What we want to keep that group there for is that we know that they're going to come back. We know that, you know, next Lent or whenever, they'll be back there. We want to be organised and we want to be ready, you know, that we can get our tambourines back out and we can go and intimidate them back on Saturday afternoons when they come back. You know, this is, this is, this is exactly what we want to do. Now, it's not about religion. You know, I mean, a lot of people that are over there were, were, were praying and, you know, waving their crucifixes and whatever else. You know, this isn't actually about religion. And I think this is a very, very important point. I know, if, if, as I said before, if Nadine Dorries cared about, about, about our children, they wouldn't be making disability cuts and DLA cuts and bedroom taxes and all the rest of it. They really don't, they really don't care. So this is, this is about, this is purely about capitalism and women's oppression. You know, they, they you know, we, we know the arguments, they? The, the, the capitalist state wants us women, you know, to, to create the next generation of call centre fodder that they can, they can stick headsets on and make a profit out of. You know, they, they don't really care. But, but it's also about keeping an us in our place. Um, if we look at look at you know, the 30th of November with the public sector strikes, out of those two million people that were on the streets on the 30th of November, 70 percent of them were women, and I think that's very important because you know the bosses don't want us out on picket lines and fighting and being organised. The easiest way that they can keep control of what we're doing is make sure we're stuck in the kitchen and the kids running around our feet, because that way we can't be out fighting, we can't be out organising, we can't be standing in solidarity on picket lines. And we know from history, don't we? You know, you look at the Mahala textile workers, you look at the start of the Russian Revolution, when the women start getting involved, that we really get things going. So, you know, they really are quite frightened of having us out there. And I think this is, this is, this is really quite important. But, you know, we, we, we've got to organise. We've got to challenge them wherever they come. And make sure we've got the trade unions and stuff again. And the, 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 the meeting was how do we do we win? How do we win again? We've won before, how do we win again? Well, I don't think we've completely won before, actually. We don't think we've completely won before. We haven't got abortion on demand like they had just after the Russian Revolution. And that's where we want to be. We want to be there internationally. And, um, you know, as long as the, the, the church and the state are, are colluding to, to, to oppress us for the interests of, of capitalism, you know, we're never going to completely succeed. They're going to come back, they're going to come back, we're always going to be on the, on the defensive. You know, the, the, the only way that women are actually able to win this once and for all is to actually grab hold of that system that oppresses us and give it a bloody good shake-up, you know, and actually change the, the system that we're in. Now, now, I'm a revolutionary socialist. You know, you look, you look at, you know, where is the one place where we've had abortion on demand? That is Russia after the Russian Revolution, you know. What I think we need to do for, for, for the interest of all of us is give that system a bloody good shake and actually have a revolution so that we can actually beat the women's oppression, we can actually have the right to do what we want with our own bodies. My name's Vanessa, I'm from the Irish Socialist Workers' Party and I just want to kind of um, come back on what some of Sinead said. Um, over in Ireland we have what's known as youth defence. Um, which is a complete right-wing organisation, um, complete, uh, completely kind of subsidised by, by America. And basically, um, what they're starting to do is really show their teeth. Um, in the last couple of months, they started up a, a billboard campaign. And the first wave of billboards was, um, abortion tears a, a woman's life apart. And they had um, billboards of uh, an unborn child and also um, of women. And the next, this round of, of billboards, because of the, the legislation, was um, one instance they went to the because of the suicide plot um, being 
in, in the legislation, they went to the riot, rape crisis centre, parked the van outside and said, um, it, I think it was, uh, abortion doesn't save lives, it just kills babies. Oh, if this is the kind of sick and um, perverted kind of groups that we have over there. What was great was three days later, um, because of an online campaign, um, something popped up on Facebook. Now, I don't think Facebook is the be-all and end-all of organising by any means, but about two, three hundred young people, mainly, went to the headquarters of Youth Defence to protest against it, which is phenomenal. Um, the second thing was, I think, the change in attitudes in, in uh, Irish society, I think, comes down to two things. The X case was a huge thing because what it did was it showed abortion is not just a black and white issue. Abortion is wrong or abortion is right. It showed that there are complications. And the problem with it was, um, looking at it now, and um, talking to people now, was there was a bit of anonymity to X. Whereas what Savita did was you could see her face. And all over the news, all over the papers, all over the world, people could see her face. And I think that was what um, the new kind of activists coming up, like myself and, and other people, I think that was significant. And the last thing I'm going to say is that it is a class war. Mm -hmm. um, there, when, when, when abortion legislation came in in Canada, one of the things that some of the doctors were saying was the only time a woman's life is at risk from pregnancy is when access to abortion is limited or outlawed. And I think that's important. But also, I think the church's line and um, I think we have to get across, the church's line on it only came into effect in 1870s, 1880s. Um, why? Because capitalism was becoming rooted and the idea of needing the next generation of workers um, and the nuclear family was a way of uh, bringing up the next generation of workers for as cheaply as possible and it restricted not only um, access to abortion, it restricted women in general and it restricted gay rights as well. And I think the link to capitalism when we're talking about why do we have um, limited access in certain countries is vital. Um, and the link, to, the link to capitalism always needs to be pushed. Um, because by linking it to capitalism, people feel not only is it a woman's issue, and I know there's, there's, there was questions as well over in Ireland whether uh, men should be on, on our demonstrations. Of course they should. Because <coughs> capitalism affects everyone. And it's only through that um, and it strengthens the movement for women's rights. I'm Gwen from Birmingham. There's been a lot in the news about having sex education in schools for children to teach them all about these things so that they know what they're doing when they get older. Also, as I understand, is you should know if you want a child or not. If you don't want one, don't have them. And another thing is, by law, you should be married. Because a word for an illegal child is a very known swear word and it's not very nice. So you should be married to have a child and you should only have a child if you really want one and can afford to keep one and bring one up. I did see the film called Vera Drake on the TV and it's been on twice and it's quite an educational thing. So I don't know whether they've got the education in the schools yet. Have they got the education in the school, sex education? They do, they do, yes. Do mm -hmm. they? Yes. Because yeah. they're in those trying to get from the age of seven, which is young, it's a good age for a child to learn. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm. Thank you. Sorry, I'm another Irish one, uh, but I'm from the north. And um, it's, this is important because actually Northern Ireland is still part of the UK, whether we want it to be or not. <laughs> And it's important that to, um, to point out what's actually happening because you were saying about um, well, uh, Wales having health devolved. Mm. You don't have abortion devolved. And actually, both in Wales and in Scotland, when the Devolution Act came, you know, went through in 1997, 98, um, both Wales and Scotland said, we don't want abortion devolved because we don't want to have the hassle, basically. <laughs> um, and particularly in Scotland, there was real fear um, anti-abortionists in Scotland organising to try to do an Ireland on it. However, um, it was devolved to Northern Ireland <coughs> when criminal justice uh, was extended to there, so a couple of, couple, of, couple of years ago. And what it actually means is, is that we are the only part of the UK 
where our local administration has devolved power. And what they've done over this last while is they've brought in guidance, uh, which actually we were looking for. So we're a bit like the ones in the South from this point of view. We, were, we have the same law as you had before 1967. And before 1967, while most poor women had to have backstreet abortions, well-off women who could go to Harley Street doctors, mm. etc., could get legal, I'm putting the legal in inverted commas, abortions in nice hospitals and nice clinics and things, but like it was a thousand pounds, which is like about, I don't know, 20,000 pounds now. Um, and uh, uh, th so we should still be able to have abortions under those kind of circumstances when your health <coughs> is in danger. Now, I actually know because um, those of us who are pro-choice activists in Ireland, um, in the North, I mean, we've had to help women whose, whose health was very much in danger, who had heart complications, who had high blood pressure, who had cancer, or diabetes, who had all kinds of conditions that meant that the pregnancy was really endangering their health. And yet they were put, they were, the hospitals just told them we can't do anything. Well, actually what the hospital says, we can do something for you. We'll bring you into hospital for the next six months mm -hmm. until you give birth. And then, you know, um, uh, your health will be your health will be maintained. Whereas actually there should be a legal right to help to, to, to abortion in the case of health. What they've actually done is they brought in new guidance that says, that mirrors the South really very much, saying that your life has to be in danger. And again, say, reminding doctors that it's a life imprisonment that they face if they carry out an abortion on a woman on the basis of her health being in danger, if they can't prove it, if they can't prove that the uh, that was necessary. So that's actually, you know, sort of the background. But um, also, I mean, I think that it's important to say that for Ireland, one of, we've never had, because of the 1967 Act and women being able to come over here, we haven't had women dying from backstreet abortions so much. We've had five in Northern Ireland since the 67 Act was passed. Five women have died in Northern Ireland from backstreet abortions. But uh, when a, um, a survey was done of GPs, 11% um, of them said that they had seen the results of amateur attempts uh, for abortion. But there's never been that kind of um, uh, survey in the South. But that just tells you about you know, that women are actually taking things into their own hands. And actually, when you talk to the people who provide the abortion pill over the internet, you find, like Sinead says, that thousands of women um, from the North as well as the South get the abortion pill every month mm. um, and cause abortions themselves. So they are illegal abortions and they are, you know, actually facing um, a face imprisonment. But do you want me to shut up? I just want to say, because I think it's actually really worth saying, that uh, the abortion pill, you know, when you talk about, like, there's only one abortion clinic in, in Wales and everything, we should really be demanding um, that, a, that, that your GP should be able to, to prescribe the abortion yes. pill. And that way there will be full access to Yeah, I just wanted to talk about a couple of things. Um, I'm remembering a friend of mine that, um, unfortunately, she didn't think she had a choice. I spoke to her when she was pregnant with her second child, and she'd had some testing done and found out she had abnormal cells. And um, I spoke to her at the time, and she said, um, I don't have a choice. You know, I've been brought up that you cannot have an abortion. It's just wrong. And so she decided not to have treatment until she, after she'd had the baby and unfortunately it was too late and she died of cervical cancer. So she wasn't there for either of her children. Um, but on a positive note, I wanted to talk about the importance of Sure Start Centres. I've worked in the Sure Start Centre for five years. And what we offer to the community, we run uh, midwife clinics a few times a week and I know that the, the midwives talk, you know, give confidential advice and include the, the, the choice of abortion in that mm -hmm. and um, also there's uh, family support workers in the centre who will also talk to the families about it. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very safe, confidential environment that is, you know, an important thing on top of what the health service offers, you know, in hospitals and doctor surgeries. Yeah, I want to come in. Uh, I'm from the RSWP as well. Uh, just to add, like, uh, on what Sinead said, uh, yes, the, this restrictive abortion act uh, and also a barbaric, it's quite barbaric, you know, like, for, uh, the fact that the, the criminal part where, you know, if a 
if a, if a woman a, a cheers an abortion illegally, uh, sh uh, she will get 14 years. <coughs> uh, I also want to touch on the church and their history as regards uh, children. Back in the 50s, uh, a left reformist uh, called Noel Brown, I think uh, he he tried to bring in free access to education and I think in some instances to <coughs> medical care and the, de the, den, the den bishops uh, made a big outcry and I think uh, uh, they uh, like Noel Brown had to basically uh, kick uh, like kick it to or shell the the issue, and you know over the years uh, people have heard about the church abuse in Ireland and uh, they've uh, there's many many cases where they could have now not a support of the cops or anything like that but many cases in the north and south where they could could have walked into an RUC barracks or guard a bar a guard a station and reported. Uh, Sex abuse and so forth. Uh, you know, like the church and youth defence, as we all know, like youth defence, I've never seen them outside uh, the doll when when child benefit cuts uh, have come in or cuts to education or cuts to coding allowance. But then, as as uh, a comrade from Ireland said, they decided to tor turn up outside uh, a south a south inner city. Uh, rape, rape crisis center, and you can imagine what it was like for traumatized women. But basically, uh, the Eighth Amendment uh, is uh, still in place in our uh, constitution. Uh, we're going to get straight into that because once the Eighth Amendment is uh, removed from our constitution, uh, it'll, uh, it'll be another. I won't make our abortion liberal. Uh, 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 more liberal, but it'll it'll uh, it'll stop. Uh, well, it'll stop the chance, whatever my new chance, that a woman could face fourteen years in jail, and that uh, that has to start straight away. For us in Ireland, uh, I don't know uh, too much about the situation here in Britain. Although it's, it's great to hear what she's doing in Cardiff, it's brilliant. But uh, yeah, uh, there's, there's still there's still a lot of unfinished business on this because. Uh, even our own uh, radical TDs had to vote against it because it, it didn't go far enough and they were right. But yes, it is a defeat for the right, but uh, it's uh, certainly not a victory for uh, women. Now, I just wanted to make the point that um Usually, uh, people who are uh, against abortion rights are also against uh, general uh, uh, contraceptive for women and sex mm. education. I noticed of uh, with Nadine Doris before um, she was doing things around abortion, she was doing the uh, absence only education for girls in schools, which didn't get through, thank God. <laughs> and uh, it, it would have been very interesting, I'm sure, and it would have worked absolute wonders, but you know. Um, <laughs> And at the same time, we see, we're see we seeing, like, in the States, like, the rise of the purity myth again, and these <coughs> chastity balls, like, uh, young girls, like, I mean, little girls as well as sort of teenage girls pledging their virginity to their fathers. I'm not really seeing the, the boy version of that. Yeah, and I'm not, yeah. I, I'm not seeing Viagra or condoms get a lot of bad press too much. I mean, sometimes condoms, but, you know, it's, it's one of those, it's, it's, it's so obviously there to hold down the sexuality of women. And yet, the, the, the big focus is around abortion, which is really unfair and has been pointed out, you know, if it was truly about children, they would be, you know, defending the, the actual things that help children, such so, as so disability benefits and child cuts and stuff. But I'm just wondering if anyone knew about, because uh, there was some talk about uh, things like the purity team of coming over here, and I didn't know if anyone knew if, the, if there had been a serious rise in that past in uh, the Dean Doris. <laughs> Marta from Elucha from the Spanish state. I just wanted to bring a little bit the picture of how it is, is there. Since the comrade, Irish comrade mentioned that uh, many people go to Spain to have an abortion, I want to say we keep, keep um, fighting for this right there because the Tories in the government now are trying to completely ban the right for abortion. So it's not that we got it and it's there. No, we have to keep fighting for it. 
and uh, because they are so reactionary, they are gonna try to keep our to bring our rights back. And um, what they are proposing is actually to completely ban uh, the right for abortion completely in any case, in case of risk for the health of the mother or the baby or what everything, not abortion at all. And at the same time, they are cutting all the social services. Uh, the money for uh, disabled people, the, the kindergartens, the everything. So they are um, forcing women to have a baby and they, they are completely oppressed. They are condemned to stay at home, not to go out for work. They don't have any uh, help with all the tasks they are doing. They are just condemning them to stay at home uh, looking after, after the baby that she didn't want to have. I have to say, uh, I think it's very important to make this a uh, subject, uh, polit- to bring it into every, uh, um, it has to be in every political, um, for example, in demos, in we, it, no matter what the, the demo is about, it always has to be the matter of the uh, um, women's oppression, including mm-hmm. the abortion. We have slogans, uh, for example, even in a funny way, no? we have one that uh, says, uh, how sad it is! How, da- how sad it is that the mother of uh, Rajoy, our prime minister, didn't have their right to abortion. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Things like that. But it brings the <laughs> we don't want you here, and we want abortion. It's a way to say that. <laughs> and uh, okay, so far we are winning the battle because uh, recently, I think a few weeks ago, uh, the government has said the, that they are. Oh, they, they, didn't, they don't say cancer, but they say postponing the um, approval of this reform of the law. So, so far, they are not going to vote for it in the parliament. And um, I just I don't want to have to become an, a very good actress to prove that I, I would suicide if I can't have an abortion, or that it is in Spain now the case. And uh, you have to prove that it would cause you some psychological harm or something like that. I don't want to, why do I have to prove any of that? I just want to have the right with do, to do with my body what I want, that's yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Claire Chandler, Boston Stowe, SWP. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is um, kind of a line subject of contraception, which people have um, touched on already. I've been involved in a um, in a local campaign to improve our sexual health services, which were uh, somewhat of a joke. Uh, so much, so much of a joke that we 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 formed a campaign around our MP, which actually managed to get us access to uh, to Anna Subri. I think that was just so Jeremy Hunt got Stella to go away. I think they just <laughs> threw a meeting with her. But out, out of this campaign have, have come to light the complete labyrinthine changes that the Tories have made to the funding of sexual health provision and the fact that only just because we had two very high up health journalists in the campaign could we actually unpick the complete kitten in a ball of string of who pays for what and if you're over here, it's paid for the local authority, and if it's over here, it's paid for by the local funding. And anybody, and I'm, it's, so this dovetails into not only what we're talking about directly here, but the other NHS campaigns. That I th- mm. I'm not sure if it's a direct tactic, but it's certainly um, something that's come along as a consequence of this. So people are just so confused about where we have to actually apply pressure that. You, you've got no chance unless you can actually sit down and analyse where everything is. If you don't know, just to keep you um, to keep you awake at night, basically, public health spending is now in the hands of the local authority, <coughs> and your, the provision of sexual health services for the clinics, not for the GPs, but for the clinics, is now part of that public health provision. It's not possible to ring fence within that budget specifically for sexual health care. So it's possible that someone can make a case that street lighting or pavement surfacing is a public health thing which would take money away from sexual health services. It's unlikely, but it's possible. Okay. The other thing to keep you awake at night is, and I didn't know this until I got involved, is that sexual... Um, Contraceptive services are not a core 
GP service. They can opt out of that. It's not something they're that, that, that's part of their contract to provide. They get extra money for doing it, which we would think would be part of it, but it's not a core service. So if they have a religious objection or any other, other objection, your GP is allowed not to provide you with a pill, which of course throws more, um, more um, stress on the clinic provided um, services, just to keep you up. And when I, um, I don't worry about that. So yes, yeah, so it's all, very complicated, and I'm sure they're doing that on purpose. <laughs> um, I'm rapidly, we're rapidly running out of time here, but the next speaker is the person at the back in the check shirt. Yes, you. And if people could just be, everybody has actually been very disciplined. If you can just keep on being really disciplined, um, we might get everybody in. I'll be as disciplined as I can, and I'm very unused to speaking in public. Um, but I work for, I am. Uh, part of an abortion provider. I also volunteer for an organisation called Abortion... Uh, what do we call? Anti-Abortion. <laughs> <laughs> abortion Support Network. That's exactly them, the Abortion <laughs> Support Network. Um, now, they're an organisation that have come together simply because lots of women in Ireland can't afford to come to England to have an abortion. Mm. So we're a very small group. We get lots of money, usually from donations. People donate to us at five pounds a month. We have women who ring up and say, I have absolutely no money. So that means that we have to find for her 350 pounds to have an abortion. And how it, that's for the cheapest abortion. We then have to find maybe the money for her flights. We also have to find excuses to give her family. We also have to do all of those things. So women in Ireland definitely have a difficult time. Women in England, abortion is not safe at all. And I know that particularly as being an abortion provider. And I see how women come to us from all different channels. In the old days, and I've been doing it a long time. In the old days, women had to rely on their GP to refer to us. Now, lots of places have seen the light and they self-refer. But all of the CCGs, these new things that used to be PCGs, are putting a limit on the money and the number of women mm. who can access an abortion. Yeah. That's where we need to fight, mm -hmm. because all of the NHS cuts, abortion is not a happy thing for the NHS, because I work for a private charity that has been established <coughs> since 1967, and is actually the largest provider of abortion services in this country. And that is because the NHS is quite happy to say, oh, abortion is a bit horrible, mm -hmm. we'll contract that out. Mm -hmm. And whilst there might be a dichotomy of kind of ideas around that, we provide a really good service. The NHS is saying this isn't something that they want to spend their money on. We need to look at education. Sex and relationships is not statutory in this country. Women, uh, Young people have to learn about STIs and the transmission of HIV, and they have to learn about conception in biology. They don't have to learn anything about relationships mm. and the discussion around what would I do if I got pregnant. And I think that if you're in a union that's anything to link with teaching and education, you need to fight that mm. that's where we need to start this fight. Because abortion is here, but it's not here to stay. Yeah. Hi, I have another one from the Irish SWP, so it's probably kind of <laughs> half the meeting is taken up with this. But just to say that um, one of the things probably that's so important about the, what happened in the last uh, week in terms of the legislation, however limited it is, it's a massive defeat for the church. And that's the first part of it. But it is not the only defeat that the church has had. We couldn't have arrived at this point if there hadn't been other defeats along the way. And so to a certain extent, we have to look at what is it and how did we organize so that these defeats happened. And they happened on different issues. They weren't just on sexual issues in relation to schools and education and the role of the church in education, the role of the church in the hospitals, the role of the church in lots of areas of our lives. Because if it was just only about abortion, and we're saying the right to an abortion, you look at somewhere like China, where you're forced to have an abortion, you're looking at the other side where Chinese women are saying, we are fighting for the right not to have an abortion. So in a sense, mm -hmm. it's about reproductive rights, it's about control of our fertility, and being, having the ability to take our place in a broader society as an equal mm -hmm. um, participant in all aspects of that. So I think that's very important. And that's come up as a, in some ways as an issue, because if you see it as a single issue, which many of the people who were 
fantastic over the last year in Ireland since the case of Savita Halepanaver and her death in an Irish hospital while she uh, pleaded to have an abortion. Thousands of people came out in the street, 25,000 in front of the parliament on a particular uh, day. But the fact about it is the numbers went up. It was a huge demonstration, but then they went right back down again because people had done their duty, if you like, and they come out on this demonstration. And I think it's really important to see it. If we don't, if abortion and fertility rights in general is not seen within a broader context, it'll go right down again and we'll find ourselves in 10 years' time fighting on another single issue case. And I, that's our biggest problem, uh, say, in the Socialist Workers Party in, in Ireland, is that we're trying to broaden out the discussion within the broad, I mean, it, it's so simple to say in the broader face, the fight against capitalism, but even on a daily basis of the fight, workers' rights, your right to participate and so on. So I do think that the single issue piece, you draw lots of people in, but how do we win uh, those who came out in their thousands, as they did in Ireland, on this, this particular recent time, how do we win them over? And that's the key that we're talking about this whole weekend, is how do we organise uh, in a much broader way. So. Right, and just depending on how long you take, we might fit in one more after you, okay? <laughs> 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 Um, a lot of people have talked about the effect that cuts in privatisation are having on sexual health services um, and abortion services, so I don't um, want to go into that too much detail, but a little example, I did a meeting on abortion at a branch of the SWP in Hackney a couple of months ago, and there was a youth worker there um, who said that um, often that they, will, they have the chance to give out condoms to young people, and anyone who bought condoms recently will know how very expensive they are. Um, that actually one day they were just told that we're not, we haven't got the budget for this anymore. This isn't the kind of thing that we, that we can do. Um, so that's the fact that on a very local level, things, are ha things, things like that affect young people in a, in a huge, huge way. The other thing I want to talk about is privatisation and the NHS, and some people have touched on this um, already. But the fact is that in, in, uh, in Britain, in, you have to get two doctors to sign for you to have an abortion. If you have a difficult time in getting one or both of those doctors to sign, you have to find someone else. And I think that we have to say that privatisation and, effect, and the effect that privatisation will have on doctors, mm -hmm. the fact that they'll be under more stress, so the fact that they'll have more people to see, all of this kind of thing, being able to provide that service is going to be more and more difficult. And that's why it's absolutely a class issue. The other thing I want to talk about is the academy status and schools moving to academy mm -hmm. statuses, mm -hmm. because the fact that schools, as academies, can now set their own curriculum will have a huge effect on what that they can teach. Um, their, their kids, and I think this is something that we actually, you know, as well as the fact that it doesn't mean that it means that they don't have to teach hundreds of things that are wonderful for children. It also means that these things that are very important to living a fulfilling life and a life that means you can make choices um, will be very, very much affected. Just a quick example of a local campaign that we've had in Newham last year. Newham's in East London. Newham's the second most deprived borough in London. Is where I live. Um, and uh, in Stratford, there was a BPAS clinic that has been open for years, mm -hmm. and it, there was an organised um, picket by a local church group in which they wanted to march from the church to the, to the BPAS clinic to stand outside it to stop women being able to access those services. Um, we organised a local campaign during trade unions, students, um, they had about 30 people, we had about 200 people on a rainy Saturday mm. morning in November and we stopped them from getting to that, to that clinic. But what I, I, we had a discussion um, that week about whether we should be the people who went to the church to say that you're not going to come. We decided against that and we wanted to instead stand outside the clinic. And the reason for that was because we didn't want to equate people who are religious with people who are bigots. Because actually we have to be open and saying there will be young people who have been in that church group who have felt incredibly uncomfortable, might have even had abortions themselves, very, very diff very in very difficult circumstances. We wanted to make them feel as if they were welcome as well to that to that picket. So that's just a small example of a local campaign. A very modest example, which means that it's just something that we can do um, in the same way that we organise in all the other campaigns that we Thank you. Okay, the last Brief, please. Yeah, I'm Emma McCann, Derry. So I'm from Northern Ireland. I just want to make a point really about the way in which, if you look at Northern Ireland in the 1967 Act, it illustrates the cynicism of British politics, politicians, specifically Labour politicians in relation to women's rights, and also mm -hmm. the way in which they have imposed sort of an amazingly ramshackle structure on uh, devolved government uh, uh, in the North. 
I, I, some years ago, I, when I, uh, I made a Labour MP, I think it was a woman from Glasgow, as I think already, uh, uh, I wanted to uh, introduce a motion for extending the 1967 Act to Northern Ireland. She was told by Mo Molan that if you persist with this, you will stir up the tribal elders. That was the phrase. <laughs> what that was code language for, you'll annoy Ian Paisley so much that actually sort of he won't agree to a settlement of any kind. Therefore, by insisting on women's mm -hmm. rights, this was the message. If you insist on women's rights, you're endangering the peace process. That came up again sort of when there was an actual effort, uh, again, to introduce a, an act, a, a motion to extend uh, the 67 Act to the North. Jackie Smith warned, and when Ian Paisley got up and said, you know, this will be terrible, you're going to extend the Act, Jackie Smith, the Home Office Minister, told Paisley, if you're objecting to this, you've got a remedy. Agree to a power sharing uh, executive in the North, and you'll be able to stop it yourself. You know, so, and uh, we've got this ramshackle system in the north whereby you don't need a majority sort of in the assembly sort of to pass an act or to stop an act. All that you need sort of is a majority of either nationalists or unionists. Therefore, a majority of unionists and Paisley, the Paisleyites have got a majority in the assembly can veto anything. Jackie Smith told uh, the Reverend Paisley in so many words, you want to stop it in the Commons, look it up since October 19 or 2005. If you want to stop this act going through, agree to share power in the North. And if you've ever wondered why it was, that there was amazing transformation in the Reverend Ian Paisley from being a bigot against having Catholics anywhere near office and anywhere near government in the North, suddenly to be chuckling on television with Martin McGuinness. If you're wondering why that happened, I could go through other things to do with gay rights and a whole lot of other things. What he was telling, he was always motivated by religious bigotry rather than by politics. And given the choice between having an opportunity to impose religious bigotry or sharing power with Catholics under that system in Stormont, he said, okay, religious bigotry takes a precedence. That's why Ian Paisley and his party agreed to devolution in the North and that was used most cynically by Labour politicians that are here in Britain to stop the same rights, minimal as they are and inadequate as they are, as women have in uh, Britain, being extended to Northern Ireland. They've all been cynical throughout it and that should be factored in any examination or analysis of their attitude towards women's rights and to democracy in Northern Ireland. That sums it up more than anything else. <laughs> But I'm going to bring the panel back in the order that they spoke, and they've got two minutes each. So, Mary, starting with you. <laughs> Blimey. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't agree that you should be married to have a child, I must say. And I don't know whether there's a rise in the number of people coming over here. But I do think it is very important that you um, know all the arguments and um, read all the books and uh, get involved in all the local campaigns and so that you know what you're talking about. And I want to tell you a particular reason why. <laughs> because in 1975, I was uh, in a bus coming home in the rush hour. I think I may have been to a, um, a demonstration before that. But anyway, I had my, my nine-year-old son with me. And he had a very loud and very high-pitched voice. So we're in the rush hour in a bus going over Tower Bridge and the <coughs> bus was full of uh, a lot of um, middle-aged respectable women this boy says Mum, do you like abortion? <laughs> <laughs> the whole bus went completely quiet I said um, well no I don't exactly well why do you support the national abortion campaign then Mum? <laughs> I said um, I'll, I'll talk about it to you when we get home he said no I want to know now so in this rush hour bus going over the Thames, I have to give Amos a rundown of why um, you know, women shouldn't have, if they get unexpectedly pre pregnant, they don't want to have an unwanted child. And I had to give him all this, um, and there's all these women going, <laughs> so I, I, I just want to say it is really important that you know all the arguments. <laughs> Um, just, uh, I mean, the, the, the question a lot of people have talked about the attacks um, that austerity is bringing against um, general sexual reproductive rights, and I think that is that is the case everywhere. It's a case in Britain, it's a case in Ireland, it's a case right acro across Europe and North uh, and North America. And I think it was very um, it was very obvious in the Irish Parliament 
um, over the last week or two because something very strange happened in that um, the two parties who were in coalition, Fine Gael and Labour, um, all these politicians suddenly discovered that they had a conscience um, and that they couldn't possibly bring themselves to vote for abortion rights because they had a conscience. Now, for the past two years, this government um, has brought in um, uh, austerity measure after austerity measure. I mean, it's not any different than anywhere else, but that have, has attacked particularly the most vulnerable um, um, people in society. But in particular, some of the most savage cuts have involved those against lone parents and those against children with special needs. Now, these are the very people who are standing up saying they're so pro-life they care so much about the unborn that they can't bring themselves to vote for a piece of legislation that, is, um, that does nothing more than protect women's lives. That's all this legislation does. It doesn't give you the right, uh, the right to choose. I think that just sort of says everything. And just one other thing that I, I have to mention. In the middle of this debate, in the middle of the night, just to show the sexism that lies behind it, one of the Fine Gael, uh, TDs yeah. took another uh, female TD, grabbed her, Pulled her, uh, pulled her down onto his lap. She tried to get up, pulled her down again, and then basically patted her on the ass when she finally, uh, when she finally uh, got, uh, got away from him. And this is basically the same person who are these TDs who are going on talking about, talking about women's rights. And last point, I mean, this is what this is about. It's about women's, li women's rights. And behind a lot of this, it's about control and about, it's about sexism. Because what is abortion rights? It's fundamental. Um, to your ability to be uh, an autonomous, free human being, the ability to control your own uh, body and to make your own decisions. And right around, right around the world, these attacks on abortion rights, that's what it's about. It's about, it's about trying to take away those rights, trying to take away uh, control, because once they can do that, if they can attack us on such a fundamental basis, it's, it's, it's not too far uh, to you know, all the other attacks. Um, that make, uh, make our lives. And that's why I think the question of class is so fundamental uh, to the question of abortion rights. Because abortion has always existed for women of a certain class. When they start attacking abortion rights, it's working class women that suffer. And that's why the question of free, safe, and legal abortion is so fundamental for socialists. Yeah. I'll be very quick because I think Sinead's just, just covered a lot of the points I was going to cover about, about, about austerity. I mean, the cu couple of things. I mean, um, you know, as somebody mentioned religion, I think the issue about religion is very, very important. I was quite pleased the one demonstration that we had in Cardiff when we had a Methodist minister that turned up and she actually did a sermon over the road through a megaphone to the, to the 40 days later to tell them why they were actually abusing prayer the other side of the road. And I think it's very, very important that we separate that, that thing, because it's not everybody that's religion. You know, you know, we, we believe in choice. If you choose to, to follow a religion, you should be able to choose to do that. What you can't do is inflict your views on other people, and that's what they were doing on the other side of the road. So I think that's very important we make that. Make that. Now, the, the other thing we did, I mean, I mean these people, I mentioned Spook. I mean, it's not just women that they're attacking. If you look at the Spook's website, they also attack gay people. They're extremely homophobic. Now, I don't know how it happened in Cardiff, but at one point overnight, the bin they were praying around got completely covered in stickers that said anti-women, anti-gay, <laughs> right when bigots go away. And that's the kind of thing, you know, I must have got hours to get them off. Oh, God knows how that happened, we've got no idea. Um, but, you know, I mean, this is, I mean, I, I, I talked before, when we're talking about the, the cuts in sexual health service, when I mentioned being devolved, but what I wasn't trying to say was that we think we can get, get, get free abortion in Wales. What, what we need to do is make sure there's funding for the sexual health services so that people don't get in the situation in the first place where they're going to have to have an abortion. You know, we, we, we want proper sex education. You know, we, we don't want the Dean Dolly to say, well, any, any, any girl at, th at the age of 13 must be told about abstinence, you know. I mean, that, you know, not the boys, just the girls. You know, it, 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 it's absolutely... It's, we, we have to fight, so we have to be, be very, very vigilant. We don't, we, we don't want them to come and attack, and they are going to come and attack. But there's two things I think that people should do. People should have a look at the abortion rights website. Now, abortion rights does an enormous amount of work, and they run on an absolute shoestring. They obviously don't get funding for anywhere else, so have a look at that, and have a look at setting up your own abortion rights group in your area, because believe me, you'll have 40 days for life somewhere near you very soon, because they're, they're, they're actually on the up. The other thing I would say is, obviously, we've discussed austerity, we've discussed the attacks on women and, and everything else. If you really want to make a difference, if you really want to win women's liberation once and for all, joining abortion rights will do a lot, but it won't do everything. What I'd ask you to do is join the SWP and stand and fight with us. Thank you.